On his maiden trip to Kenya, Tanzania President Dr. John Pombe Magufuli Joseph never shied away from hitting the nail on the head regarding this monster that his own country seems to have buried many decades ago. Mambo mengine yote Kenya ni excellent. Tatizo ni ukabira. Najua maneno haya yatawachoma kidogo lakini lazima niwaambie hapa hapa. Muumalize ukabira. Ukiisha ukabira. Kenya is the best country. Just how has Tanzania managed politics of ethnic diversity so well? given that it has over 120 tribes, nearly three times the number in Kenya. Nini kilifanikiwa kutouingiza ukabila katika kitovu cha siyasa za taifa hili na weza kusema kwanza zilikuwa ni juhudi za rais wa kwanza wa Tanzania, hayat baba wa taifa, ambe aliweka misingi imara ya kuambia wazi wazi. Sio kusema hapa tu, tangu moyoni, kwamba ukabila huta tusaidia chuchote bali huta tufofisha. Na alipiga vita kikamilifu, tangu katika teo zake za kisiasa, harakati zake za siyasa zilikuwa nyumuishi. Na aliposhika hatamu, hakaendelea kusisitiza kwa hatuweze kukubali kujenga e, e, taifa linaloendekeza ukabila. Tasa sisi tuchofaulu wa Tanzania ni kwamba ukabila wetu una, una kama yale maelekezo ambayo mwenyezi mungu wa maelekezo wa islamu. Kwamba mewaumba wote binadamu kwa sirile le moja, akawapa makabila ili mjuane tu na si kwa sababu nyingine yoyote Julius Nyerere himself was one such a person he was not about amassing wealth for himself for his family for his cronies or for anybody else for that matter he was about leading he was about governing he was about the welfare of the people and so he did not need his tribe to protect him or to protect his wealth. Nyerere was a humanist and he thought in building a social infrastructure, in building a nation that cares for one another. Now you can plant the root of economic progress on top of a very solid ground of social harmony. So he followed that route. And I want to say this, that in my opinion, in my considered opinion, Tanzania will bypass Kenya in 10 to 15 years, unless we can change the path that we have chosen for ourselves. Because to, to, pro, to succeed as a country, even economically, we must build a united nation. Tanzania were very deliberate about how they went about it. They deliberately entrenched that unity and, you know, oneness of a people. You know, now we must be very deliberate about it. We must address the issues of exclusion, which I believe is being addressed under devolution or can be addressed under devolution, where development reaches out to all parts of the country and that everybody feels that they are that there's an enabling environment for them to be able to maximize their full potential and to do whatever is required to, to get whatever job that they need, not on the basis of who they know and not on the basis of their tribe, but on the basis of that they are qualified to do that job and on the basis of merit. I spent a little time in Uganda just trying to understand how come that uh, as of that time, this was around 2005. I came to learn that uh, ever since President um, Museveni, of course, he has his own separate uh, issues at the moment, but uh, as of that time, I was informed he had never had more than two Bahimas. President Museveni is a Bahima in his cabinet. And I kept asking, how come? The answer I got was that he reasoned that the Bahima with his own seat have got a big enough seat. They don't need to have other ministers. But if you contrast it with Kenya, it's, a, it's totally different. nations, And that's why Ali Mazuri and Michael Tiley write a book which they call New nations and states in Africa because these are nations which did not exist. Nations that are emerging such as ours that are conglomerates of different traditional nations otherwise known as tribes require enlightened leaders whose focus is service to the people, whose focus is on giving equal access to opportunities within the country to everybody, regardless of their ethno-linguistic background. 
The tragedy with Africa has been that those so far who have been privileged to occupy those positions have been by and large thieves. Have the relevant institutions failed? For instance, we have the National Commission on Integration and Cohesion that is mandated to champion and rally for unity in the country, together with other key institutions in the society. We have been running civic education across the country, explaining to the Kenyans why, it is, why we are stronger together and not our party. That we have really very successfully done. So we have been trying to educate the Kenyans to understand that. To understand that we serve or work, exist in a single market. That you cannot go to a, a supermarket and find that this corner, the goods being sold here are for Jubilee supporters and they are cheaper. And the ones being sold on this corner here, they are for NASA supporters and they are more expensive. In other ones, we are operating in a single market and we are the same no matter who is in power. We have been trying to explain this to the Kenyans because once they can understand that, then it's possible to defeat ethnic mobilization and ethnic emotions. In my opinion, they failed. But they failed deliberately uh, because there has been a lack of will from the people who hold the power to make them functional. Uh, when we see, uh, we look at the NCIC, while uh, they are there, they have very little power. They do not have prosecutorial powers. And also, there seems also to be a kind of a balancing act. We saw during the campaigns, uh, one side of the political divide, you know, would clearly infringe the law, but there would be a kind of a wait and see to find some kind of infringement, no matter how minor, from the other side of the political divide for you to effect you know, some kind of action. Well, there is the belief, obviously, that the church has gone down. But you know, sometimes we live, in a, uh, uh, we live by comparing. You know, the times of Ndingi Mwananzeki, Alexander Muge, uh, Timothy Njoya, and some of these strong church uh, leaders who left a strong legacy that we feel like we, we need someone to take over from them. Our times change, history changes, and at this point in time, I can say, or we all say that the church, of course, is this time around is working more from the background. Uh, I think the church has learned that uh, perhaps it's better to do the so-called soft diplomacy, you know, uh, work with the people from the background. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that we can't do more. We'll never do enough. We'll always want to do more. And I want to believe that as a church, especially in terms of uh, moral integrity uh, as, as a country, I think that we really need to work more. We need to be more present to create a conscience to help our leaders be uh, people of conscience. Breeds lawlessness. And if our leaders are in the forefront, of entrenching impunity, then we are done because they are the ones who are supposed to be the benchmark of integrity. So I wouldn't say that it has failed, but I would say that as we exit the stage ourselves next year, then the new team that comes, they need to be selected carefully. They need to be selected, they need to be people who really have this country at the heart, and then we need to invest in the organization so that the organization can do it. But more important, I think, is the leadership. The leadership needs be to be genuine about the national cohesion and national integration. That is absolutely crucial. Because you know, we don't listen to NCIC every day. But uh, believe me, we listen to our president every day. We listen to the leader of the opposition every day. We listen to our MPs every day. We listen to our MCI, MCAs every day. So it's the entire national leadership that need to accept that we are stronger together as a people. And then it take that agenda forward. Is there a ray of hope? The problem is not unsolvable. It is a big problem, but we need the necessary goodwill whereby people learn to be selfless because it is selfishness that is that is breeding this because for me to ascend to where I need to, the best and the most direct route 
is to balkanize my people around me so that they become the ladder by which I ascend to that position. It is not sustainable. We are doing it, we've done it at the national level and every election year, it becomes a situation where the nation is forever on tenterhooks. We are doing it at county level. We are seeing clans. This big clan is the one that gets all the big you know, positions, the ones that are deemed big and the other ones are left behind and you, you, this group is too small to get. We have seen it where clanism is, uh, uh, you know, uh, part of the way uh, people identify themselves so that you now have people of the same ethnicity. They are literally brothers and sisters, but then find a reason to divide themselves on the basis of clans. We have to come to terms with our history. Even in school, students are discouraged from studying history. There's a myth that history is very difficult, that history is boring. Basically, you are being told you should not have memory. You are being told you should not remember anything. And that's why any time you talk about historical injustices, for example, you are told, forget about that. We don't want to be told about history. Why are you telling us about that? Until the day we come squarely face to face with where we have come from, with historical injustices. Look at the narrative of Kenya's history. We are not told about the many different the struggles of the different ethnicities against colonialism. The narrative is heavy on one tribe, you know, and so that they are celebrated as the heroes, the heroes of our struggle. When you listen to some of the ethnic uh, radio stations and uh, TV stations, they continue to further that narrative. So what that does, it creates that entitlement from the people of that tribe to be able to say, this is ours, it is ours. We have heard the sentiments that are made that, oh, these people don't have a stake in the economy. What are you saying? Every Kenyan pays. Every Kenyan pays tax. So everybody has a stake. We all have a stake. If you are Kenyan, you have a stake in this country. I think there is hope for this country. We always have faced problems, and we have always overcome them. So I believe there is hope, because we are very reasonable people. We don't, we are not meant to commit collective suicide. I don't think that is our, our, our fate on this planet. Have independent institutions lived up to their expectations? I think they have tried to be fair to them, but um, they, are, they could have done much better. Because how was even the appointment, the appointments to those bodies done? There was a resemblance in some cases of equity, say like IBC. But in some of the others, people basically being rewarded with offices. So they need to do much more. So, and I think it's incumbent upon them. They sit in very important institutions, ranging from the DPP, the ESCC, the NCIC, the Kenya National Human Rights Commission, and so on let them up the game because they've been given the mandate. Some of them have even uh, security of tenure. But anyway, I was saying, let's, number two, let's embrace uh, merit, equity, and diversity. Because it's not unusual, you may find that all the best doctors come from among the Ogie community. Uh, do you then appoint 10 doctors all from the Ogie? I think there must be a resemblance also of equity and diversity. So at the national level, let's have the face of Kenya. And it's, it's not that you cannot get best doctors from Giriamas, Dorobos, and so on and so forth. You, you can't get them from any and every community. I want to be very honest with you. The institution is set up under the 2010 constitution as independent. They have not delivered to the Kenyans' expectations. And the reason for me has been very simple. The way we have not recruited the people truly qualified into those institutions. Meritocracy. You know the Chinese, why the Chinese are a superpower right now? They made a decision a long time ago. The only thing that matters 
is meritocracy. And that is also Article 232 of our Constitution it stresses that. If we follow on that, then these institutions will not be letting us down. You have to see that these institutions are letting us down. Then the other thing is also appointing politicians into these institutions. Because the tragedy is that these politicians, their minds are totally formed. It's very hard for them to see any other way except the one they have known, they have grown with. And especially these old fellows, they were the Kenyans who are a little bit aged. They are so closed-minded that when he, you know, when you want to be honest, for example, uh, and you talk to them, given where I come from, they will say, oh, you, you must be NASA, or whatever. They cannot contemplate a situation where you can have an independent thought. And the society is never helped by dogmatic people. Society is always held by people who have flexible minds. So the independent institutions, we need to bar politicians from occupying these institutions. And then when we also select, we select the people who can stand on their two feet, intellectually, uh, morally, in any other way, so that they can now move the institution. Best Kenya we want for our children and grandchildren. We haven't seen that Kenya in the past 60 years. So the premise in, in this um, regard is to achieve it, we have to address historical injustices. And that's agenda four. And we're being careful here, we are not mentioning the TJRC, the Truth, Justice and Re uh, Report, uh, the Commission's report. Because we also like the fact of the, the sensitivities of the day, their emotions are still fairly high. Some of them are pretty deep. And, uh, but it would be good to start addressing at least some of the key issues, which all which were appear, appeared and were discussed in Agenda for which people forgot. To sum it up, this is what former South African president, the late Nelson Roshilala Mandela, once said, there is still too much suffering on our continent that could have been prevented by leadership which put the interest of the people supreme. He says the conflict, war and instability in many parts of our continent must in great measure be blamed on an absence of leaders who are capable of or willing to subject personal and sectional considerations to the well-being of common good of the people. Duncan Haimba, KTN News. This is KTN News.